So I was feeling a little bit cocky when I wrote this uh, abstract and the uh, the title. Um, I was uh, I was actually watching Silicon Valley at the time, and I worked out you needed to actually kind of sell yourselves in these kind of situations. And it had actually been two years since uh, our software package, the Python ARM Radar Toolkit, had been released, and uh, just this talk kind of gives an overview of what we've done since then, um, the things that have worked, the things that haven't worked, but also how it's kind of grown beyond uh, a simple software project to something that actually encompasses many users and actually many uh, other software packages that are now relying on it. Almost that kind of fifth shell to the stuff that um, was being talked by uh, Jake this morning. And I must, you know, put forth that I wrote this talk before Jake's talk, so I'm not just copying the things he says when I get to the end. So I'd like to especially thank my uh, collaborators, um, you can see here, and um, so first I want to actually give a little bit of a radar meteorology 101, so we can actually understand what kind of data set we're dealing with. And I've got this new app on my iPad that allows me to draw things. So I've been going all cartoon crazy recently trying, trying to draw concepts. So here's our cloud. The cloud's raining. Our radar admits a uh, pulse of radiation that is uh, well defined in space and time. It travels out. It will scatter off all kinds of things. Raindrops, birds, aeroplanes, windmills, and will receive some sort of um, signal at the receiver. And we define a geophysical parameter called radar reflectivity. And radar reflectivity is the sixth moment of a drop size distribution. So small drops scatter less than big drops. So an increase in radar reflectivity could be a uh, heck of a lot more small drops or just a couple more big drop, but we want to be able to back out this geophysical information. So when you see a radar image uh, on the National Weather Service side, or when I show them, they often will show uh, reflectivity and logarithmic units. So just a basic idea, you know, uh, zero dBZ is kind of moderate drizzle, uh, 10 dBZ you're starting to get to rain, you know, 30 dBZ is fairly heavy rain, 50 dBZ is really heavy rain mixed in with some hail, and if anything above 50 is mainly hail. Um, oh, another thing about this, we, if polymetric radars transmit radiation that is both horizontal to the Earth's surface and vertical to the Earth's surface. And one of the things, one of the measurements I'm going to refer to a lot in this talk is something called differential polymetric phase. That's a difference in phase between the horizontal and the vertical components, and it's proportional to a liquid water path as you travel throughout the atmosphere, because drops are shaped like oblate spheroids. So the horizontal component gets lagged more than the vertical component. So what are the traditional approaches to working with weather radar data? Before we come, what did we get frustrated with enough to sit down and write our own software package, to reinvent the wheel, so to speak? Um, People would base, and this is actually, this is almost a carbon copy to what you know Jake and what uh, Travis were talking about this morning. People would grab a bunch of radar files, and then they would basically um, daisy chain existing executable software packages together that dumped out the temporary files and created intermediate files, and then the final processing was done in something like IDL or MATLAB. They would then write the paper, the paper would get accepted, and then they'd move on to the next challenge. And generally, that software would languish. It would never be used again. It wouldn't be accessible to any other group. It will not be version controlled. It will not be documented. Basically, it's lost intellectual property. Um, so PyArt has a different approach. And Jonathan's already given you a very, very good background of PyArt, but because this is being filmed, we've got a couple of new people, I'm just going to briefly go over some of the benefits of PyArt again. Um, so. Python is a data model driven Python architecture for interacting with weather radar data. The key is the data model. You can have a variety of radar formats, it will return the same kind of data model. Basically, the collection of Pythonic variables and things like that in the programming language, which means that my processing will take in a radar object, it'll give you back a radar object. And that's all you need to know when you want to write a module for PyArt, as long as you do that. So, here's an example I'm going to import PyArt. 
set matplotlib in line. Reading in, this is, a net, this is actually one of the ARM radar files from the uh, north slope of Alaska in Barrow. Uh, this, till recently, was the furthest, most north weather radar on the planet with publicly accessible data. We now have one even further north. It's one of our radars again. Instantly, I can work out some information about that radar file and plot out a, uh, the lowest tilt of reflectivity where I've gone like that and collected my reflectivity information around Barrow here. But the nice thing about PyArt is, oops, not only can I do that for Barrow, I can do exactly the same thing for an X-Rad radar outside of Portland, Maine. It's exactly the same code with, you know, just changing a couple of limits here and there and a better color map, of course, not using PRISM. Um, and it just works. I'm completely data source agnostic there. So what PyArt has is unit testing, con uh, continuous integration. We have two funded developers. But we have 13 total contributors now. Now this is, I know I kind of put this out there and I'm really proud of it. And then I hear something like matplotlib or numpy that has a huge number. But this is a very, very domain specific uh, application where 13 contributors is actually a, a non-zero percentage of the total number of people who use radar data there. It, it's actually a significant portion of the community. And it has a vibrant user community. We have an active email list that gets an email or two every day. Again, no big deal compared to the numpy discussions list, but we're pretty happy with that. Here's an example. I, I love, one of the things I love about uh, GitHub that I don't know why um, is the network charts. I love seeing what people are working on. Oops, sorry. I love seeing what people are working on, what they're doing, and how they're integrating in with the larger project. Um, I just, it's a very nice graphical ref representation. Um, so Jonathan and I were plodding along putting extra features in, working with the rest of the community, and then something miraculous happened. Out of the blue, we got an email on our desk saying, hey, there's this guy in uh, Germany called uh, Mike Heistermann from the University of Potsdam said, I want to capture what's happening in the whole open source radar community. And within, gosh, I think it was like three months, we had an article in BAMS that actually described what we're doing at the moment. And the really nice thing about writing this paper was it forced us to sit down as a community and go, where do we want to be going? Why are we writing this paper? What do we want to be doing? And the outcome of that paper was to kind of define all our toolkits, where they sat, and how they interoperated. So there are three dominant radar codes, uh, Radlib, BoltRad, and PyArt. And there are their logos there. So PyArt, now we're going to use this term magic. Magic refers to how much the code helps you and tries to guess your configuration there. So with PyArt, the magic is in the box. Basically, PyArt will look at the radar object and go, aha, I see this is an RHI. I think I should be plotting it this way. Or, you know, I see that you've got this metadata in there. I should be doing something with that metadata. Um, it is interactive. You sit down, you can type in a command, you can get it back out, or you can script it. It is, has some Scython optimized conditional imports. We make heavy use of conditional importing in PyArt. You can download a basic version of PyArt and it will just work with very, very minimal dependencies. Uh, basically, Conda. Conda and matplotlib, and if you want map plotting uh, base map. Um, however, if you add some extra toolkits, such as the NASA RSL libraries, um, some of the uh, linear algebra libraries, you'll get more features in PyArt, you know, but, we don't, but they're much more difficult to install because they're not necessarily Conda installable. And it's community developed. Radlib is a collection of codes. It's a collection of things that take in a numpy array with some arguments and return something else. The user has to add the magic there. You have to know how to configure it. It is interactive. It's also written in pure Python, so it has very minimal dependencies, uh, no need for a compiler, and it's, commu again, community developed. BoltRad, which is a Baltic uh, States radar network toolkit, um, is the magic is everywhere. It's written to be a processing environment. Uh, it's an operational environment, not really intended to be uh, interactive necessarily, yet you can use some of the modules in that way. Um, it is compiled code with a thin Python layer. It's community developed, but very heavily pushed by the EU community. Um, one use case we found very cool was uh, using uh, Pyre and Radlib to do a fuzzy logic uh, algorithm to detect what was doing the scattering. Um, 
we had scikits.fuzz, but one of the things we wanted to do was use the texture of that polymetric propagation phase field to use as a determinant of what was going on. So we want to pre-classify returns to the radar by what was causing the scattering here. Here's a bunch of code. This is an example of using uh, PyArt. We read in some sounding data. We retrieve the right time out of that sounding data of the radar scan time. Um, I then use this PyArt retrieve.map profile to gates to map the temperature and height to my radar gate. So I now know at each individual radar gate what the temperature is. And that return, then I add those fields, so I add the sounding temperature and the height to my radar. I then retrieve, this then calls radlib, and retrieves the texture of the complex phase. And I'll get to what that means in a second, and adds that to the radar. And then I also receive the signal to noise ratio. So what is texture of complex phase? This is just a flat view of complex of the phase as the radar is scanned through a single scan. So instead of laying out in a nice uh, circular vision here, I'm just looking in terms of time and range from the radar, and this is the polymetric phase as it's gone through some storm clouds there. We can see they have this highly textured region here where I've got no returns, no scatterers. It's basically random noise. And some regions here, I've got very nice phase, and this region in here, I've got what's called a fold. Basically, I only have 360 degrees of phase change until I switch signs, I go over one full complex rotation and I'm back around to zero phase. I've gone from uh, plus 180 to minus 180 there. If I take the texture of this using Radlib's texture code, this is what I get. I get very, very high texture where I have no uh, valid radar returns and I get nice low texture where I have valid radar returns, great for putting into a fuzzy logic algorithm. I can build a nice trapezoidal, one side trapezoidal algorithm like that. But I also get this little peak around where I get the folding. One thing we worked out was cool to do is instead of treating it as a, um, an a, a, uh, angle, I just looked at the real part of the complex phase. So we nice and smoothly go through that fold there now, and we've actually come up, Jonathan's actually come up with an even better way of doing that, uses both, uses the angle and the angular change at the same time, so, and again, we get this cleaner phase there using the real component of the complex phase, so, and again, grabbing that data and plotting it out, there's my temperature, looking at this planned position view, there's my signal to noise ratio, and here's my texture here, where the texture's very high in these regions of invalid returns. We then threw this over to Scikit's fuzz with a couple of classes. And if you, I'll show you a link at the end. There's a lot more behind these slides in the notebook that shows the membership functions. But we're able to classify, classify things as ice, melting uh, layer here, uh, rainfall, and also what we call multi-trip returns and regions of no scatter. Thank you. Um, and I'm also using matplotlib's um, animation function here. This is the nice thing about Python interacting with matplotlib and the rest of the infrastructure there, able to do a quick animation here. I was impressed about it do this, because I only see some people use PowerPoint, and they can't get animations working in PowerPoint, so I have animations working in an IPython notebook here. So that, that, that's a technology win for me. Um, so very quickly, what are people using PyArt for? People are using at the University of Wyoming, they've built an interactive viewer. NASA for doing microphysical retrievals. At, um, I'm not going to try and pronounce that full name, I'm sorry guys, but SIMPA in Brazil are using as part of their operational system. Um, and of course, lots of educational uses as well. So here's an example of ArtView, an interactive viewer for radar data. Basically with a Python backend, you're able to scan through the radar data, look at it in time, zoom in, at NASA, PyArt provides the engine to ingest data from polymetric radar. It can then easily be used to grid and save the data to look at in the future. And this, support, uh, this work supports the Global Precipitation Measurement Program of NASA. And here's an example of rainfall retrievals, which is this one right here, uh, from one of the NASA radar systems. And finally, this is one of the really cool applications here. Uh, independently, because it's on GitHub, a group in Brazil, a private-public partnership, picked up PyArt, using it to read in and grid, to convert to a uh, radial grid, to a Cartesian grid, their radar data, pre-processed, and they hand it off to their operational system so you get these nice 
maps on top of a map there that's disseminated to the public. Um, so, going back to my talk title, what's the secret to our success? Well, stuff you all really know, really, because this target audience kind of knows how to make a good package. So, but a couple of truths we all know. For one thing, engage your program managers. Uh, collect metrics, highlight at meetings, and engage in social media to sell your package. Show them the good that it's doing. And I'm very happy to announce that the ARM program of the Department of Energy is funding PyArt development at the moment. So this is actually an official program. Uh, run courses. If you have a good set of use cases, good set of people, um, get them over that potential hump of using your software package. Uh, stuff you should be doing anyway, version control, unit testing, documentation, and continuous integration. And really importantly, and again, this goes back to what um, Jake said this morning, know your niche. Um, we can't all be the next Numpy or Matplotlib, but there's plenty of space now filled for more software. Um, uh, know the state of the app ecosystem, know what's out there, work out how your uh, app fits in with it, and respect the other applications and work out how to interoperate between them. Um, and that's been a real success story with us and the other developers of Radar Software. Um, so in the f what's in the future for PyArt? We need a roadmap. Um, we've now grown to the stage where so many who are wanting to help, we need to work out where we need to be going, we need to actually work, what are the real things that people need to be able to do that they can't do yet? Um, the grid object. Um, so we've, we've spent a lot of work on the radar object and getting that right. We need to develop the grid object better. This will benefit other projects. We need a generalized grid object within Python. Uh, we've got to do a couple of things, the projection issues, more retrievals, more I.O. and more courses. So here's a bunch of links. Um, the talk's all online. And uh, any questions? I know two pi art talks in one session. Um, the grid objects. Yes. What, what's a grid in your number? Sorry, I got, yeah. So the question was, uh, with the grid object, what is a grid in our nomenclature? Um, that is actually what we're discussing right now, is just how inclusive do we want to make it? But basically I see as any structured object, as in it could be in negative coordinates, it could be pressure coordinates, it could be, as long as you're able to define a definitive X, a definitive Y, and a definitive level thing. And so again, the X and the Y could be latitude, longitude, it could be um, X and Y displayed in a particular point. And you know, the, the Z could be uh, sigma coordinates, it could be pressure coordinates. I don't think we want to go to unstructured grids. Um, but that's just my view. I could be convinced differently. Might if we go to unstructured grids, we might as well be defining a an almost all-encompassing container. So I kind of, again, like the know your niche thing, I want to get something well designed, right, and doable rather than spending too many years designing something, you know, and never really getting there. So the, the tip was that plotting on maps. Now I'm going to have to ask you to how how do you how do you spell that? F O L I U M. F O L I U M. Folium apparently is a really good so mapping thing. Okay, okay, that's good. But I know that our collaborators in in Radlib they've been using GDAL a lot and building their own custom stuff again because of the need to, for more speed. So.